Would you be happy to uh, introduce yourselves and your positions within the company yep. as well? Uh, I'm Pete Rogers, I'm the director of VFX, so I, I run the studio basically at Gorilla. Yeah, uh, I'm AJ Anthony, and as far as it was my first project, I'm actually a composter at Gorilla. That is such a good first project. Yeah, <laughs> good CV. I'm, I'm jealous already. Um, and just roughly, you know, this is a, a really easy question. What happened in your lives up until this Gosh. moment now? Um, no, like, so in terms of, <laughs> so just in, in chronological order. Yeah, you, probably, you can go non -linear. I'm older, it's going to take a lot longer. Where, where's this very fine with non -linear? In terms of like basic bits of training or, or if, if you were trained or uh, way, what kind of key moments in your life that kind of led you professionally to oh, do okay. something, if you're happy. They're very different stories, I guess, from both of us. But, well, that's um, good. Yeah, I just kind of stumbled into the effects, not, not intentionally. Uh, I, I studied in Swansea. Um, I did uh, business education. I wanted to be a screenwriter and film director, and my parents, were, I come from Dorset, and my parents were like, how can you do that? We live on a farm. <laughs> I'm like, well, let's just move somewhere else. Uh, and they were like, well, you need a profession behind you. So my theory was if I trained to be a teacher, I could write on the holidays. That's a really bad idea, by the way, which I realized as soon as I started teaching, I'm like, you can't really do anything else. Um, and then did, graduated, worked in radio for 10 years, and then got offered a job in an animation studio. They then started doing VFX. That got me into the studio that I'm in now, and I've been with the company 11 years. Right. Um, so just kind of another film, I guess, got me to here. Yeah, I did, well, I said that, I did, after I graduated, I did courses at Rain Dance in London. I did um, screenwriting, directing, and producing courses. I did them too. Um, All the best people. Uh, so the producing course, I guess, yeah. has kind of helped me with this, and I'd run run a radio station, so when somebody wanted someone to run a VFX studio, transferable skills, and then I just had to learn about VFX uh, over the first couple of years. And right. then, now I kind of, I do kind of know what I'm doing. Yeah, I, do kind of I would say so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so we've, and we've, and this project um, came completely out of the blue. Uh, we do all the VFX for Casualty, right. and the wife of the VFX producer on <laughs> Asteroid City was a producer on Casualty. Right. And we did an episode for her, and she said, oh, I should introduce you to my husband. We used to work together at the Henson Company. He's a VFX producer. He's looking for studios to work on a film. And I said, yeah. she said, oh yeah, okay, what's it gonna be? And then I had a meeting with him, and he said, it's called Pop 87, which was the code name for the film, which is on the side of the star. Um, and I was like, oh, what is it? So I talking about it, and I said, well, who's it for? I said, where's Anderson? I said, oh, okay. And then, so yeah, so we kind of, we were one of, I think, seven or eight companies. Um, yeah, so I'll we'll come back to that in a minute. Yeah, yeah, of course. It's slightly different than how we usually work on this production. It's a bigger production with more companies. Um, right. But yeah, so kind of fell into VFX and then 11 years later ended up working with Wes Anderson. But in, in retrospect, all of those were the right choices. Yeah, yeah, they were. Uh, yeah. Um, and AJ, how, how did you get started? Yeah, what so did you my journey is not that long. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I stumbled into VFX intentionally. So I uh, grew up in India, so uh, you guys should know it's like cinema and sports especially cricket is like a big thing in india uh so yeah so i do love cinema uh it's, it's challenging it's exciting and he wasn't very good at cricket <laughs> uh, yeah i'm not good at cricket yeah. Yeah. so so if, if you are a if you're into cinema even like irrespective of the hierarchy or in the position you used to get like a respect there but in contrast, you're not allowed to go into cinema unless you're not good with your studies or you get close. People are going to cinema. That's the reality yeah. there. So you, you go into cinema if you're not good in education or grades. So that was a, a, a big struggle for me to actually convince my parents to get into cinema. Yeah. And I was in, initially into editing. Uh, uh, and that's where I came to know that a whole new department called VFX actually exists. Yeah. And yeah, that's how I chose VFX. I came to University of South Wales. Yeah. Finished my graduate, graduated there, and got into football. And then you know you knew Gorilla as a sort of local, mm, very yeah. well respected company. So, um, I love I love hearing that it came through Casualty. Because I know. I, well, no, one thing I, I sort of hear in a lot of film academy events is that you know like it's it's sort of connections, but it's not always the connections you expect. And sort of just being out there doing good work, making you know making content. Yeah, there's lots stuff. of other like ways I could see that it could have happened. That was probably the least likely. If you yeah yeah. So, um, but yeah, just yeah, did good work. The thing is, we always say like every job you try and win three more. So if we get, if we do a good job and deliver on time, then the director might want to work with you again. The producer might want to work with you again. The post supervisor might want, to work, might want to work with you again. So if a job goes well, you then got three new jobs, then next job, and then it kind of that's how 
that's how the business grows really you can't really market what we do because you can you can do a website and stuff but uh, and social media things but you're really talking to, you're not really talking to the people who actually make the decisions it's, it's all about kind of who you know so yeah. a lot of it is kind of recommendations like like that slightly unexpected one no, I think it's a great one. And with um, a, and just sort of just to give a context of, of what Gorilla works on, I know that, that the previous incarnation is is based on some of the team were on the. Uh, yeah, we changed, we rebranded in the middle of this production, <laughs> right, which okay. got really confusing uh, for them and us. Uh, but yeah, so our credit is Gorilla, but we were baked when we started the production. It's fair enough. Uh, but it ran long enough that it <laughs> yeah, yeah. went through two companies. And but and so to give people an idea, of, like so you you do. Uh, I mean, casualty presumably is a lot of work because it's however, you know, 40 odd episodes. Yeah, yeah, like casualty is kind of our bread and butter. So we, because we, we're a small company, we haven't, like, all the London companies have got massive teams, like 100,000 people, or 100,000, 100,000 yeah. people, uh, with different departments. Because we're quite small, we're 11 now, which is the biggest we've been. We've been as small as like four people. Um, so you wear lots of different hats. Uh, but yes, yeah, so we tend, we started off doing like kids TV. And then off the back of that, we've got Casualty, which we've been doing for eight or nine years. Um, like you say, lots of episodes every year. And then off the back of that, we just started to get in with directors. And as they kind of moved up to TV, we'd do TV with them. As they'd get a film, we'd do a film with them. And we've kind of organically grown um, over the past few years. Um, we've done two seasons of Heartstopper for Netflix in the last couple of years, um, which is a really good show to work on. We did Dream Horse, with the same director, Eros Lynn. Um, Apostle with Gareth Evans for Netflix a couple of years ago. So we've kind of slowly been chipping away yeah. at bigger jobs, and this is probably the largest, um, well, the most well known, I guess, thing that we've worked on. And these are all kind of like, sorry, like Welsh projects that have a kind of an international reach. Or yeah. well, not all of them, sorry, but some of those that you're mentioning. Yeah, like, a mixture. I guess we started off doing things that were shooting, so much shoots in Wales. But I'm, so I spent the first four years in this job, people going, Oh, do you work on Doctor Who? And I'm like, No, we don't work on Doctor Who. <laughs> now it's, Do you work on his dark materials? No, I don't work on his dark materials. But over time yeah. there's become more work but it's not it started off things that were shooting here and now it's more like directors that are here so Eros who directs uh, Dream Horse that, that did shoot locally but then he moved on to Heartstopper which didn't shoot locally shot the Slough and took us with him because right. he enjoyed the experience of working with us on, on Dream Horse and before that on Kiri which also shot in Cardiff and, sort of, Cardiff and uh, Bristol so um, again it's that thing if you build relationships and then that relationship it's, if, you know, if it goes well they take you on to projects with you which considering he's directed his dark materials and Doctor Who and Daredevil, was quite nice that he likes to yeah, yeah. work with us on his on his indie kind of stuff. But I think it, maybe it speaks well of the Welsh film industry that actually it's not just Doctor Who and it's not just his dark materials. There's actually there's loads of things. There's so directors, much being so. being filmed. I think the most it got to was just after lockdown. There were 23 productions being shot in South Wales, um, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, I like it because I don't have to live in London. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> still nice. get a London type job, with, but but get to live down here, um, which is much better. Um, but yeah, there's, there's loads being done and it started off, I think, just what was being filmed here and now the crews have become so experienced, they're moving on to other stuff and directors are kind of, their careers are kind of um, working through the industry quite quickly. So yeah, we've kind of just been, uh, sort of moved along with that really as, as the people from South Wales have kind of gone to do bigger and better things, we've been able to go with them. Amazing. And AJ, was that something, as you were sort of graduating from USW, was that something you felt and you sort of knew that actually I can stay in Wales and, and there'll be there's lots of opportunities here? Is that, is that yeah, because uh, I, I was fortunate I got into uh, Bait. Yeah. Uh, even before I, I, I got offered the job even before I graduated. Thanks to, yeah, because. Um, I think that means you're good though, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks to my lecturers who gave me a good yes. re positive responses. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So talking about that, uh, as soon as I got the job and I told my classmate, like uh, I got so uh, even his guess first guess was Doctor Who or his dark material because we didn't actually reveal the what project we, we, they were working on. Yeah. So he just said it's a big director and a big project, uh, and their first guess was uh, Doctor Who and his dark materials. Yeah. So. And so this this opportunity comes uh, comes to you and it comes through this interesting connection, but presumably it's not a done deal. You, you, you have to then sort of pitch for it, or like what, what, yeah, what are I, you given and what do you have to I'll, If I explain all the usual processes, then, I'll, yeah. then the process wasn't this, because they're not quite the same. So most of our work, which is why I like working at a small studio, is directly working with directors. So most of the time I'll get a set of script, I'll read the script through, make notes on it, and work out what we think is VFX. The production will do the same. Come up with a list, the director will agree that list. These are the things we think are VFX. It's never the finished list, because when you're shooting, things will change, but 
we use that, then we basically put a price against every shot of how much we think it will cost, how long it will take to do, and what our methodology is. And then you kind of pitch that with the showreel, and then if you know, they look at a few different bids from a few different companies, and the, if the relationship's the best one, if the price kind of works for their budget, and you've interpreted the script in a way that they're happy with, then that moves forward as a, as a project. Um, this is more how we used to work years ago, which is more, didn't read the script, um, didn't really know what the film was about. Um, we were sent scenes that had already been shot. So usually we'd read the script, send someone on set to supervise, and then work with them really closely in post. So we've got a little bit of an influence on the creative process. Um, with this, because it, they basically, Wes has got a um, company with the VFX team in it. So they kind of, the, the, the main VFX are done by their internal company, and then the internal company pick other companies to work with them, if that makes sense, um, to sort of outsource certain sequences. So we were sent 150 shots to look at and price up, and then got an email back of, these are the 65 shots you're doing, and then they were delivered to us. Right. And then, so I, well, until I saw the film, I had no real understanding of the context right. of yeah. any of the stuff that we worked on at all. Right. Um, which particularly with this kind of film, was like, yes, I, I think it's about this, this kind of happens. And I watched it, and I, oh no, it's nothing right. to do with what I thought it was to do with, really. Whereas usually I can go, oh, okay, and explain to the artist, right, to get a sense of how this is going to work, this is how the scene works. And also, we hadn't seen an edit, so what usually would happen on that normal process, they get to the point of assembly edit, and they send it to us to look at, so we can just check how the shots are supposed to work, get an idea of tone and stuff. We never saw any frames apart from the stuff that we bid on, so we only saw the things that we might be working on. Right. Then we were told which ones we were working on, then we had to delete the ones we weren't working on, so it was basically these 65 shots just made in the studio for 10, 11 months. Um, and that's all we kind of knew. We had a sense of like the overall top arching story, kind of, the, the enough that had been press released, and we knew all the big names that were in it, um, but that was kind of it. Does it help then to, to be doing it for a really experienced director, because then you have the sense of like, other bits in their filmography, so you, you have a sense of what style he likes. And yeah, so. yeah, and you get a sense of the work that you're given as well. And I guess as well, this is the other thing is a little bit more arm's length, which is more how the big companies work. So usually, we'd have a call every week with the director and the producer. I'd spend my time talking to the producer mainly, and then the creative leads would talk to the director, and we get that kind of relationship going. With this, it was we reported into the production company and the editors, who then fed into Wes. But we didn't have any other direct contact, whereas usually, we'd be talking to a director, because the level that we work at, we tend to talk to the directors on a weekly basis. So the, it's a difference for us, I guess. We were working kind of slightly in isolation, and you know, you're getting your notes kind of, sort of slightly secondhand sometimes. Yeah. Um, but no, it's good. I mean, there's some, some, a lot of stuff is miniatures. You've seen the real, lots of stuff is like green screen and comping into miniatures. But there are some shots in there that look really simple, but <laughs> really, really hard. AJ, what, what kind of, um, what, how does it feel when you, th you, you do get told what film you're working on and uh, what, what was kind of the workflow ahead of you? Was it, was it completely different to work you had done before or your training or was it, you know? Yeah, so how did I feel like it, it was all coming together and it took a while for me to process it because yeah. I, I didn't graduate, so I got a job and uh, the first project was Wes Anderson's project. So it took a while for everything to sink in and by the time I processed it, like I was I think my, my first shot was in the Aspen City shot. Uh, it was in the back. Yeah, I think it was. From the yeah, so few shots because maybe they were testing me or something. Right. Uh, yeah, and then I uh, uh, jumped into Asteroid City and uh, it wasn't anything what I did in uni. <laughs> we dropped you in the team. Uh, because at uni, like, we do the briefing like for ourselves and if it's too <laughs> difficult for us, we just don't do it yeah. or just change it. But uh, such things are not happening inside the studio, so we have to do what uh, the brief is. So, yeah, it was challenging, but uh, uh, it was exciting as well because it was um, first job. Then. Yeah, yeah. Again, I'll, I'll continue the eager questions. But do you literally, is, is the company kind of working on like one shot at a time, or are you kind of subdividing into little groups and then you maybe working on a few? How's that? Um, that all goes? the shots were kind of in play. So we, we did 65 shots on the film, which isn't that many. Most projects we do is like two or 300 shots, but 60 doesn't sound very many, but it took twice as long as most other projects because of these different layers. And because, you know, people might have been on a shot for like six months just making sure that it all kind of came together. So. We'd have, we have different like leads and different supervisors that were kind of brief a person, but it would go through different people. So there might be like roto and clean up to do or prep. Um, so the juniors tend to do more on the prep and then hand it to someone else. Um, but because we're a small team, we do what I 
always liked about how we work is like someone like AJ can come straight in and be compositing on a shot for shots for a show like this. Yeah. If you go to London, you're a runner for the first year, then you do a bit of roto for another year. Bit of mind you've graduated. Yeah. Um, and then you might get comp in like a third year into the industry, um, which I've never really quite understood. Um, so our thing is, when we pick the best students, uh, bring them in and then just throw them at shots because that's what they've learned to do. I mean, in fairness, we're quite lucky. Our, our head of 2D, we came from the uni and was the head of a course mm -hmm. uh, because basically post-Brexit and with other changes to the industry, hiring became a lot harder. So I thought, I know what I'll do. If I hire the head of the course, then their graduates maybe won't go to London and we can, they can actually come and work for us instead and that's worked. Really well. I was, I was doing dailies with them for three years and still doing right. the same person, so that was then well, quite a harder transition for me. Yeah. The also thing is, well, you know, if you're coming in and work, suddenly you go from, like, like AJ said, you work on your own project with your own time scale and a brief you can change to, right, these are your shots, this is when they've got to be done by, and this is the expectation of you. It's quite a big jump when you come into the industry. So, again, the other reason, not the only reason we recruited Jack, was to help bring people in there's also someone to help nurture people and bring them through so you haven't got that oh my god i've got to get this stuff done because it's a proper job now you get yeah. you know, there's someone there that has worked with you before or knows your strengths and weaknesses and can kind of uh, bring you through but you know over time we're getting you know we're bringing more people from other courses and, and other backgrounds and then um but you know, still use that same kind of nurturing approach really um but, but you know we're not afraid to chuck people on a, on a big show and on difficult shots because I think that's the best way to learn. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I was and just so this doesn't feel like a, a performance review for AJ, I'll make it sort of vague. Which is, I'll ask both of you, what what do you feel like are the qualities that a you know will make a student or a new graduate or a new you know stand out to kind of get hired? Like this can be for either of you. Like I'll go with you, AJ first. What do you think? You can you can be about yourself. The things that are great <laughs> about me are, or you can sort of just speak sort of generally. What do you think sort of makes people stand out and gets people hired in the industry? I'll just say what my lecture used to uh, yeah, yeah. Us, like feedback in the form of feedback. Like we used to go for challenging projects, modules, like when I'm with SM module, we go for like a big challenge. Even though they used to say, don't bite more than you can chew, uh, we still used to go for the challenging projects and we used to get that done. So sticking to a deadline and uh, sticking to a schedule is very vital. Yeah. And getting a good show review, that's getting a good show review will automatically get you a good job. Uh, and then, yeah, being the good books of your lecture. Yeah. yeah, we spent years looking at showreels. And networking, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We spent years looking at showreels that were all kind of the same. Right. And you were like, well, I can't really tell these people apart. So that, that's improving over the years, but we've got better at showreel. For me, it's the people that are actually genuinely interested um, and do bits away from the course. Because like years ago, our leads all are kind of self-taught, they do like a fine art degree or um, something completely different because VFX courses didn't exist, so that's what really helped. Uh, <laughs> so, so they're kind of self-taught. Whereas now, there's stuff you can do on YouTube, there's stuff you can do in college, there's stuff for short courses you can do, and then you can go do a uni course in it. But in some ways, you're just getting this, you're learning just this kind of linear thing of this is VFX, whereas we almost want a bit more of a rounded view. So I'm interested if someone on their CV says they're interested in photography. So if you're interested in photography, they probably understand lighting and composition. Um, and it's things they've done that's, oh, we were taught this in college, but actually I went away and I learned this other software in the evenings. It's people that have just gone a little bit of a, a step past just doing the stuff they've been asked to do. That's the bit that usually, for me, makes me go, okay, that's, this person's really interesting because they've got a slightly more rounded view than just this one direct line into the effect. Right. And uh, when you say, like, sometimes the show, show reels that you see kind of all feel the same, is it that you're, when you when you find with something that's different, is it because it has like personality to it, or is it or just like is it a different kind of flair, or what what makes one feel different? Um, I think it's, it's difficult. I think for, over the years, these people have worked on a group project, so they'd almost put the same reel in because it's the same work. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Done. yeah. Um, <laughs> literally the same. And some things were like you know everyone would model an elephant and it would and do a turnaround of an elephant. It's like, okay, there's five of you have done an elephant. This one's marginally better than that elephant, but it just yeah you. I'd be being terrible. You could get a bit bored of looking at the same thing. So sometimes it edited a bit differently, music's a bit different, which, but that's not really to do with the VFX. I think I, your reel will get you halfway there. Like that would be the kind of first thing. It's like, okay, this reel is better than those reels. I'll look at this CV first and find out about the person first. So it's, it's kind of a balance, but um, yeah, just being a little bit different, just trying to stand out. Right. And I was just going to, this is like maybe just a business question, but when you were talking about like, 
um, you know, you get your list of shots and then you do pricing and, and timeline. Presumably th those are your skills that just come with experience, like in terms of like knowing how long something will take or likely or uh, how much the yeah, price it's, is. It's really hard. Yeah. <laughs> because it's like years ago when I first got into the industry, people would do like what they call a bag of shots. You basically, it's this many shots, there's this price and you do a fixed price. And then halfway through, you'd realize it would take twice as long and you'd lose loads of money. And there was a big run of companies going out of business um, because that doesn't really make any sense. I came in from another industry and I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> like, yeah. You really need to be more on the specifics. And so we're much more shot related. And then in theory, the idea is you, know, you do a price for something and if, if they can't afford it, years ago, it'd be like, oh, come on, guys, come on, exposure, just yeah. do it for less. Now, because we've got a bit of a reputation and I've worked on more stuff, it's like, okay, well, you let us know which shots you want to drop then because if you drop the shots then they can come off your list and you can afford it but it is a, it's kind of a dark art it's kind of half science half maths half guessing um, that's three halves yeah my the maths bit maybe as well <laughs> 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 uh, so you, you do have to go it's an educated guess yeah but what we always do is we try and keep rebidding because when what you read in the script is one thing once it's been shot it's a different thing once it's been edited, it's a different thing. Once you start working with the director and getting notes, it's a different thing again. So we don't hold ourselves to a price until the edit is locked. And we've had time to basically watch each shot in turn and work out. Because either like, you might see it as a, like a quick time that's like HD and go, oh, this is going to be quite straightforward. You get bring in the like, proper media, 4K, and you look at it and go, oh, there's this thing I couldn't see on the HD. And now I've got to, we've got to paint that out, which isn't in the brief. And so a lot of my job is just going back and forth to people going, this has got to change, this has got to change. Yeah. So like we can, we can bid on the project maybe like 20, 30 times, which is quite mad, really. Um, but I'd rather do that than just go, that'll be okay, and then just, you know, um, it not work out. Um, but saying that, like a shot can go through lots of iterations, you know. Most shots, like 10, 15. I think the most on this film was 135. Right. <laughs> yeah. Do you think, I mean, that might be quite specific, but do you think that something like that is quite, you know, revealing where, the, you know, the idea that the things that you spent loads of time on are not always the things that people notice, you know, but then it's all, all good. Yeah, I mean, hopefully you shouldn't notice any of it. That's the, yeah, yeah. the idea. That's, and that's why a lot of our stuff is more invisible VFX. Because, yeah. you know, appreciate this has got spaceships and stuff in, which I had no idea until we saw the film. Yeah. Um, the spaceships and aliens in it. But obviously they're quite stylized and very kind of stop motion. Um, but I think in a way it's like, I, sometimes I think what we do is harder because if you're working on a big like Marvel movie, the expectation is some of this is virtual production, some of this is green screen. You've suspended your disbelief that you know, in fairness, Rocket Raccoon looks really good, but you know that's not. Yeah. I think, sorry, spoilers. It's not what? Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like when we're working on some like casualty, you go, well, actually, this is like, I'm watching this. This is like a real world show. You can't yeah. really have something that looks like it's been shot against the green screen. It's got to look kind of real. Real world is sometimes harder to do because everyone will see the real world all the time. Yeah. So working on a show at the moment, and even simple things like um, shot a car scene with virtual production, but then it didn't look quite right. So they asked us then to come and add reflections to the to the window. But it's really weird. You can't get your head around. Well, what, what does a reflection look like in a window when you're looking into a window? Because you don't really look in someone's car window when they're in the car because that would be weird. Yeah. Um, and so we went out to the car park and got a camera out. And just like sat in the car and just kind of went, okay, this is what it would look like, and then rebuilt it that way. So we do lots of like real world references. Um, like, okay, what would this person look like in a car from that distance? Right? Like, can you go and sit in your car and park it out in the building, and we'll get a, the same lens out and start to get a sense of it? So I think sometimes real world stuff is a little bit harder because you you don't necessarily know what you what makes things look unreal. I find now because we will give like on a map painting if you're doing like a um, a kind of mountainscape or something, and there's, there's some map paintings in, in the observatory shot. You get so many notes on that to make it more and more real. Then I'm out in the real world, and I'm like, that sky doesn't look real. Yeah. <laughs> nothing looks, if you start really looking at stuff, nothing looks real, particularly skylines, because they're just like optical effects and lighting and stuff. And it's like, well, actually, you get more notes on stuff in a film than real life gets away with a lot more than we do. Just to return to the idea that you were one of multiple vendors, which I know, like, you know we've all seen credits on films where it does say VFX by multiple things. Is that something you've kind of had to get used to? Or is we've that done it on a couple of things before and we've been, we've done a couple of films where someone else was the main vendor and then they were like, we were working in partnership with them, which means they're the people approving the shots. Um, this is the first time we've been kind of a, a flat structure almost. You've got the production company and then all these different vendors, but all working on their own types of sequence. Like there was one, someone who's working for us now, worked on the show for someone else. 
Um, and he was working on more of the kind of alien-based stuff, whereas a lot of the stuff that we did was more like the desert stuff and some of the black and white um, scenes, yeah. um, the observatory stuff. So. I suppose that's just a reality. In, in a way, I, I'm sure it's tricky because everyone's going to match their work together, but it's sort of like kind of a global... Yeah, there was crossover. Like we had to show our observatory shots to another company because they were doing different sequences, but there were bits that happened in the observatory. So there will be sometimes where you're either sharing assets or um, showing each other stuff. On some of the big films, there's so many people working on it, it's so big, they might be completely independently working on stuff that crosses over because there isn't time to share the assets and stuff. Yeah. And does that feel empowering that you can, you know, Based in Wales, you can work on a film that was an American film shot in Spain, and you know people are working on it from everywhere. Yeah, I think so. I, because like years ago, with like all the limiting factories that were in Wales, and you know everything goes to London, it was nice to be very like, oh, everything goes to London. I complain to the Welsh government a lot. Everything goes to London is not fair. And then you get this point. Of, I think, to be honest, lockdown made a big difference because in terms of people are used to working remotely now, so we've got more access to a wider pool of talent than we had before. But also, I think productions have gone, well, actually, do we want to go with these massive companies who will stay on a film for, like, 18 months? And, like, at the moment, because of the writers and actors' strikes, those are big companies have made loads of people redundant. Whereas the smaller companies, I say, like, we can move from this project to that project. And you kind of... And for us, it keeps it more interesting. But I think there's been a big shift, I think, towards... For indie productions, towards some smaller and medium-sized companies. And people are a bit more agnostic about where people are. Like, there's some really good companies in, like, South America... And, Egypt and Sweden and, and so we, there's more it's more of a global community whereas it was very much American based Harry Potter made it very London based and has been really since then and that's kind of stayed and then Canada was really big and it just it kind of moves around we just kind of pick our little pocket and actually we always were like oh we wish we could work on these really big things but what we've done is we've kind of got this middle size projects that works really well for us and actually the actors and writers strike didn't affect us as much as other companies because we're doing medium-sized three-month projects at a time, so we can just go like that. Whereas if you expect them to get a year-and-a-half-long project and it goes away, that's a year-and-a-half's worth of work and revenue that's, that's disappeared. Whereas for us, we can go, OK, we can squeeze in this little job before we move on to the next job. So it's, it's the best of both worlds, I think. Brilliant. And uh, AJ, to sort of slightly wrap things up now, but like, um, how do you feel? I mean, things are going great for you already. I, I mean, yeah, <laughs> full of jealousy. But how do you feel about um, the industry and, and specifically the industry in Wales and opportunities going forward? That you yeah, I think we are going to like be, we had we had two more uh, clients with that uh, came straight into the lab, like the same as me. So right, yeah. So the the recruiters and the industry is ready to give you a job, uh, and there are plenty of jobs. So we should, as a student, we should prepare ourselves to go and get into the industry and. Yeah, the, the future looks bright for us. Amazing, what a great ending. And also, you now know everything to succeed. I expect great success <laughs> from all of you, no question. Um, I'm, well, if, if anyone has any questions, now is the moment. But again, you, you look like you've absorbed everything. I appreciate you've got great posture. It's worked out really neat. Um, I'm very glad that you're here tonight, and I'm very glad you're here in Wales as well. And um, so let's give a big round of applause to you. <laughs>